making their way in. Still a few seats. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Behrens. I'm the Associate Director for Administration and Scholarship in the Goodson Law Library. And on behalf of the Goodson Law Library and the Office of the Dean, I am very pleased to welcome you all to our faculty author celebration for the Oxford Handbook of Comparative Foreign Relations Law, the new book by Professor Curtis Bradley, Duke's William Van Alstyne Professor of Law. Since 2015, the Law Library and the Office of the Dean have co-sponsored this faculty author celebration series to celebrate and recognize selected faculty book publications throughout the school year. This new Oxford Handbook is a groundbreaking work in a relatively new field of study and includes 46 chapters contributed by leading scholars. Some of the esteemed contributors include Professor Bradley himself, who wrote two chapters in addition to editing the volume, as well as Duke Law's own professors Lawrence Halfer and Ernest Young. You can, of course, read a copy of the handbook in the library's collection, and it is also available to you online in the database Oxford Handbooks Online, which is good because it's very heavy. <laughs> Before we begin, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to those who helped make the event possible today. Our co-sponsors in the Dean's Office, especially Senior Associate Dean for Faculty and Research, Maggie Lemos, the library's heroic business manager, Sue Hicks, as always, our media services and events office staff, and of course, many thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Here to provide introductory remarks is Lawrence Helfer, Duke's Harry R. Chadwick Senior Professor of Law, and as I mentioned, a contributor to the handbook. Please join me in welcoming both of our speakers today. Thanks, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure uh, to introduce my friend and colleague, Professor Kurt Bradley. Kurt and I have worked very closely together here at Duke for the last decade in many different capacities as co-teachers, co-authors, co-directors of the Center for International and Comparative Law, and most recently as co-editors-in-chief of the American Journal of International Law. That's a lot of co's. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that I know his research agenda and scholarly contributions quite, quite well. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that Kurt ha uh, has long been a leading scholar of how international law intersects with U.S. domestic law with a particular expertise in the developing field of U.S. foreign relations law. His publications in those areas have been uh, cited by many federal courts, and his work is widely read and influential with uh, legal academics, political scientists, uh, and others. Uh, foreign relations law, as I'm sure you'll soon hear in more detail, sits at the interface of public international law, so the rules governing uh, treaties, customary international law, international courts and tribunals, and international organizations, and domestic constitutional law. Now, the U.S. Constitution, for those of you fortunate enough to have taken uh, any of Professor Bradley's courses, you'll know that the U.S. Constitution contains several clauses specifying which branches of government create, apply, and interpret international rules that are binding for the United States in its relation with other relations with other nations and also within the U.S. legal system. But much of foreign relations law is not specified in constitutional text. Rather, it's been worked out over time through the practices of the different branches of government. And Kurt's work has been especially impactful and influential in analyzing these practices both from a historical perspective and as they have evolved in response to a range of contemporary uh, challenges. Now, scholarship on the field of foreign relations law is most developed in the United States, thanks in large part to Kurt's writings and those who have been inspired by his work. But the, the book that uh, he will speak about today represents an effort to broaden the field to other countries and legal systems in all regions of the world. It's been quite a long journey, as you'll hear, but it's also been a very productive journey. And I've been privileged to be one of the academics involved in the project from the beginning. And I think it's completely fair to say that, that being involved has expanded my own uh, research and the perspectives that I use and think about in my own work in new and interesting ways. So I'm sure you will uh, learn a lot from today's lecture. And please join me in welcoming Kurt Bradley and congratulating him on the publication of his new book. Thank you so much, uh, Larry, for the introduction. Thanks to everybody for coming. I see uh, many uh, of my students and former students 
I see many of my faculty colleagues, and I appreciate your attendance. Thank you to Jennifer in the library, and also to the dean's office for arranging this book celebration. Um, what I thought I would do is sort of first just give you a little bit of kind of a personal story or historical account of how the book came to be in my journey through it, uh, and then a little bit more substantively talk about a few themes that seemed to emerge as these various authors were working on, on the project, and also kind of provocatively some anxieties that I think the project uh, provoked at various times, and I'll try to describe what those are. And then maybe a few words about where this field, if it develops, might go in the coming years. And then if there are time for questions, I'd be happy to take those about the project as well. Uh, just in terms of definitions, Larry mentioned foreign relations law, and uh, that's what this book is about, and a lot of my writings have been about. Uh, just in terms of the definition that at least people in the book use for that, it's quite simple. Um, it is the domestic law um, of a nation that governs how that nation interacts with the rest of the world. So quite a capacious uh, a definition. It would encompass most notably questions of allocations of authority, uh, which actors within a country has control over making treaties, pulling out of treaties, participating in international organizations, uh, using military force and other foreign affairs activities, and also the choices that nations make about uh, incorporating international law and norms into their legal systems. And that's at least what in the U.S. we've called the body of law called foreign relations law of the United States. Um, I feel that in the U.S. it's hard to know exactly when it starts, but probably at least since the mid-20th century. Um, and I'll give some reasons a little bit later about why that might be one date one would pick for the formation of that field. It consists of constitutional law in part, but also often statutory law, administrative law, judicial precedents, and something I'll comment on in a little while, um, sometimes constitutional customs that might actually not have legal status, but might play a significant role in how a legal system operates. So a personal story, how did this come about? I had been teaching US foreign relations law for around 20 years or so. Um, this was about six years ago, five or six years ago. And I had developed a case book on the subject. Uh, it's now a sixth edition, actually going to a seventh. It's in the page proofs now. So it's, uh, I actually was teaching Professor Rachel Brewster in the first edition of this case book at the <laughs> University of Virginia. Uh, she remembers it because 9-11 also unfortunately happened that semester and kind of changed the outlook of the, what the book had to focus on for quite some time. Um, it's gone through enormous editions. I've really been, that's been kind of a core of my research. And as part of that is also just thinking about how international law really works in the US, both today and in historically. And so I've also written particularly a monograph on that uh, topic. But as a confessional, I would say that my learning curve on those topics, although I do learn every new things every year and when I teach a new group of students, the learning curve flattens out over time if you've been working on something for two decades. And I really was quite interested in trying to find ways to learn about things I didn't know much about. And one area I didn't know much about was how other constitutional uh, democracies, in particular, make similar decisions about treaties and foreign affairs and war and how they allocate authority in their own systems and whether they, there might be interesting differences between uh, how countries approach these questions. And I, I knew very little about it. Um, there, I knew there are reasons why you might find differences, even uh, among countries that otherwise have some similarities. Uh, countries have their own constitutional histories, which are unique to them. Um, just to take one example, it would not be surprising to find different approaches in post-World War II constitutions, some of the European countries, for example, than in the United States has the oldest written constitution in the world, written for a very different time. And you might think that foreign relations law would therefore be different in that respect. Presidential and parliamentary systems have different approaches to the separation of powers. That's likely to impact foreign affairs. Uh, the understanding of what courts ought to do, the role of the courts, I think does vary quite a bit from system to system. And then, of course, I think geopolitical status, uh, the, the status of a country within the world at a particular time and its power likely affects its legal decisions and structures as well in foreign affairs. At least that was my guess. Um, so one would expect differences. But I also think it's likely that countries just also make different policy choices about where to allocate power, how embraceive to be of international norms, and the like. So it did strike me that this is going to be a good area 
for comparative study if one can do it. I'll give you one specific topic that was in my mind five or six years ago. I have a, a long worked on issues of US war powers. Uh, that is, who controls in the United States the decision to use military force? Uh, to, to what extent is Congress uh, a required actor in decisions to use force, for example, or, is, or can the executive do most of this on his or her own? And we have an odd situation in the US where at least many people would read the text of the Constitution and early understandings to suggest a strong controlling role for the legislative branch for Congress. Indeed, I teach in my foreign relations law class that the first three US presidents against interest all confess that they had to go to the legislature in order to do anything significant on war powers. You don't see presidents normally just making concessions against their interest in that way. And yet we also have, particularly since World War II, a very significant practice of presidents acting unilaterally in the war powers area. Um, and what to make of potential disparities between the text and early understandings of the Constitution and a very robust practice now for 70 years or so. And then throw in a statute that Congress finally did try to uh, use to, to reintroduce itself into the field. This was in the tail end of the Watergate years and Nixon administration, the War Powers Act, that most people think has really not worked well in practice, that it has not allowed Congress to kind of reclaim the war powers. Um, and then you might look to the courts and you would find that they're largely silent. Uh, they're not silent about a lot of other things in American life, of course, as you know, but war powers, they have basically stayed entirely out of both the constitutional and statutory questions, with a footnote, I would add, uh, about certain issues in the war on terror, which are quite interesting for that reason. But the broader issues, can President Trump use force against Iran or something like that? The courts have just stayed out, and has really, they've really left it to battles between the two branches of government. So that's an area I've long thought about. And then uh, you may, some of you may remember, around 2013, uh, President Obama was thinking, came very close to using military force against Syria when they crossed his red line about using chemical weapons. And at the very last minute, uh, apparently walked around the White House grounds, thought about it at night, and changed his mind, and decided that he ought to go to Congress first. And he gave an explanation for it. And interestingly, part of his explanation was clearly that he had been potentially influenced by what just happened in the UK the prior, just a few days earlier, when the parliament in the UK voted to whether to participate with the US in a strike on Syria, voted no, and the prime minister in Britain decided to respect parliament's decision. And Obama stated that he was mindful that he was the president of the world's oldest constitutional democracy and uh, thought that he should go to Congress. That, by the way, was probably strategically quite an unwise move on his part. It almost certainly was going to lead to a defeat in particularly the House of Representatives who were not supportive. He, in some sense, was saved by the Russians who negotiated a diplomatic resolution for the time being with Syria and therefore it never went to the Congress. But it was an interesting already looking at kind of comparative practice. And then soon thereafter, um, a New Zealand, prominent New Zealand lawyer, Campbell McLaughlin, wrote a treatise, uh, this is Obama explaining his statement. Uh, Obama, uh, Biden does not look very happy for whatever reason in that <laughs> slide. Um, and uh, Campbell McLaughlin uh, writes this treatise the following year just about the Commonwealth, the UK and other Commonwealth countries, now staking out what they were going to call foreign relations law as well. It's not just the US. And in various places in the book, contrasting it with the US approach on similar topics. So that seemed to begin a conversation, uh, at least between the US and Commonwealth countries. And I thought um, that suggested there, there could be lots of other conversations. And so what I did was I organized a conference in Geneva. At that time, Duke still had a summer program in Geneva. And we used part of that program to have uh, a series, what ended up being a series of conferences on comparative foreign relations law, courts, treaties, custom, the use of force, some of the topics that had been in my mind. And I thought that was, it ended up being very productive. It was primarily um, a mix of people from the US, Europe, and Canada predominantly. And I thought that was very productive. But the one thing that was missing was really get insights from other parts of the world, which I thought would be quite helpful. Uh, it takes money, however, to do that, to bring uh, people to these conferences. Um, 
then Fortuity came along, and about that time, Duke University and the dean's office nominated me to seek a Carnegie grant, which would have given money for this sort of thing. And I was lucky enough at the end of that year to get the money. Uh, this is me taking the bag of money, basically. Um, so that helped quite a bit to think about. And I proposed to Carnegie that it be a series of conversations that would broaden this beyond Europe. And that's what we did in uh, the next couple of years. So we had a conference in Tokyo, Duke Japan Conference on Foreign Relations Law. And it was not just the Japanese, although there were many people from scholars and government officials from Japan came. But also, it allowed us to bring in lots of other folks from Asia to join in this discussion. Uh, we then had, an, and this is some of us uh, at one of the restaurants in Japan. And then uh, we had one in South Africa as well, uh, in Pretoria, uh, similar topics, but now bringing in a number of African uh, countries into the conversation, and also just others where it was easier for them to get here as opposed to some of the other locations. So it definitely was broadening the geographic scope of the project in exactly the way I'd hoped now that we had funding to do it. And not just academics, as I said, but also some government officials at each of these locations added uh, their own insights, kind of practical insights to the conversation. And the other thing that's then happening, of course, is, um, and this is us in South Africa, the jacaranda trees, a nice time of year to be there. Um, we also had one in Leiden, I should say. So we also have now a summer program, as some of you know, in the Hague in Leiden, and we uh, added a conference pretty recently uh, there. The other thing that's happening in 2017 is that the UK Supreme Court issues a blockbuster opinion in separation of powers in uh, Great Britain, and it, of course, concerns the Brexit issue. And the issue was whether, given the royal prerogative of the executive in Britain, uh, whether the Prime Minister is required to go to Parliament to withdraw from the European Union Treaty, there'd be many reasons to think that the Prime Minister is not required, given the strong executive traditions in the UK. And nevertheless, the UK Supreme Court said, yes, the Prime Minister is required to go to the Parliament and get permission first, which the Prime Minister did. And as you know, it's been smooth sailing ever since. <laughs> Um, so that uh, very interesting blockbuster opinion about foreign affairs by uh, this high court of the UK further broadened a lot of conversations around the world about uh, what other countries are doing on topics like treaty exit in this particular case, and maybe how to pull some legislative power back into the equation, which was happening in that context. And they cited, by the way, Cameron McLaughlin's Commonwealth Foreign Relations Law Treaties in their opinion. Uh, showing the connection between scholarship and academia uh, and judicial decision making. So we have these conferences. They were initially lots of people from around the world doing short discussion papers, um, which then got revised and revised and discussed and lots of trading of drafts. Ultimately produces, uh, as you can see, pretty hefty tome um, of 46 chapters. And so we tried to have representation from really all the continents of the world. Um, we have more representation from some areas, obviously, than others. Europe and the U.S. in particular are still heavily representative, but we have some from Asia and Africa and Latin America, which broadened the field of the book. The, here are the topics we ended up covering. Uh, a lot of just framing stuff at the beginning. What is this field? And I'll explain why that needed to be a framing. And what kind of issues might that uh, pose if we had it as a field? What are the methodological problems of trying to study across uh, these different systems? And then topics you probably expect, making uh, treaties and other agreements. Federalism, for some countries like the US, a major topic. But there are over 40 federal countries in the US. And so we had chapters from Switzerland and Canada, other federal systems that had interesting comparisons to the US. Uh, engaging or disengaging from all sorts of international institutions, like the International Criminal Court or many others, has become a very big topic. Uh, all sorts of issues about how treaties and custom apply domestically. Immunity and comedy issues, uh, sovereign immunity and immunity of heads of state and others um, discussed in those chapters. And then something I've touched on already, which is the use of force issues. And we had a number of perspectives there. And they range, on purpose, they range of a mix of, I would say, theory. Like, what's the general kind of overview set of issues for these topics? Some chapters are about that. Some are actually big and empirical chapters. That is, look at many countries, and well, maybe all of the ones at least that have written constitutions and do big uh, data kind of analysis. We had a number of those chapters that tried to look broadly at the world in an empirical sense. 
And then many case studies as well, where experts within a system took some of the common issues we had identified and tried to go very deep on them to illuminate them from one country's perspective. So it's really a mix of those kinds of, three different kinds of methodologies. Um, you know, I, this is a fun stage. The book is out. I get to talk about it. And, and many stages were fun. The conferences were fun. Learning and meeting all these people from around the world was terrifically enjoyable. The later stages of hurting 50 or more authors, which is what we ended up with because of co-authorships, you know, there were challenges uh, around the world of getting everybody to actually submit things on time and uh, kind of follow certain suggestions and the like that we did in the editing process. It all worked, uh, I'm glad to say, and people were cooperative, but it was an interesting management uh, project, um, as you might guess. So that's a little bit of the, sort of how the project came to be. Uh, I, I do want to talk about some themes. I do also want to say there were two people who were uh, there at all the conferences. That would be uh, Larry, but also my wife, Kathy Bradley, who uh, was there and all supportive. So I appreciate that. Um, very supportive, uh, appreciative also of the dean's office. I need to thank the former dean, Dean uh, David Levy, who was there uh, in many ways to support the project for many years, and my current dean, Kerry Abrams, who's been very supportive of promoting the project and celebrating, which I also uh, greatly appreciate. Okay, so in terms of just a few themes uh, and then a few kind of anxieties and provocations that I think the project generated, maybe still is generating. So in talking with these people from around the world, uh, obviously I was looking for what are the common topics, at least, even if they're very different approaches. And one thing that comes through in a lot of the chapters, and, and Larry touched on this as well, is a lot of foreign relations law is not captured by just looking at formal law. Uh, and if you looked at just constitutions and statutes, you would be missing, in some countries, most of what's going on, interestingly <laughs> enough. And it's certainly true in the United States. If you had someone look at our 1789 Constitution and describe our foreign affairs, it would literally be the opposite of most of our foreign affairs law, in, to the extent they could figure it out at all. Uh, many key foreign relations law issues were never put into the Constitution. Um, I remind my students, don't be too hard on them. They were working in a hot building in Philadelphia for, for a few months, you know, right after uh, various crises. They did reasonably well in light of that, but um, it's not surprising they wouldn't have necessarily touched on how you know, uh, we should use cruise missile attacks in 2019. It's just not going to be something they're thinking about. And there are lots of issues, it turns out, that are like that. Could the founders ever have imagined the presidency as it exists today? Almost certainly not. Um, they were worried about legislatures being super powerful. They didn't realize that that would change. Um, so it's easy to see in the United States, and uh, institutional habits and political norms are significant here. But it turns out we learned they're significant many places in ways that you have to sort of really drill down to figure out. And of course, in some countries, judicial precedents go along with that as well. But it really means it can be quite hard to do the big end empirical studies unless you also kind of combine it with a lot of qualitative work. I'll give you a couple examples just outside the US. Um, since about the 20s until very recently, the UK had just a custom. So their formal, they don't have a written constitution, but their formal constitutional rule is the executive gets to make treaties. They don't need the parliament's assent. But since the 20s, they had the Ponzinibbi rule, just a custom, that the prime minister would lay before the parliament any proposed treaty for 21 days just to see if it had objections, not thinking, though, that they had to get parliamentary approval. You would not know that, obviously, unless you had some pretty good deep knowledge of the UK history and traditions. Now, I think it may be a sign of the times. Great Britain Parliament decided to codify that in 2010 and no longer rely on constitutional custom. Um, and I think that is a sign of the times, at least there and probably here as well. We learned in Japan. Um, they have the requirement, like the US does, it looks like, on paper, that the executive actually get legislative approval for treaties. That's what our constitution looks like as well. But they don't always do it. And so we tried to find out when they do and when they don't. And they explained they have something called the, the O'Hira principles, named after one of their foreign ministers from the 70s, just a custom. And it's very vague. Uh, it's written down this in a document, but the custom is the, well, for important agreements, of course, we would go to the Diet and get approval. And for unimportant ones, we won't. Um, ones that really touch on legislative prerogatives, we will go to the Diet, but not for ones that are less so. It seems quite vague. And we said, well, how does that get maintained? And how do you actually, how, how does the executive like not just kind of eke out more and more power? 
And the lawyers from the Japanese foreign ministry said, well, we would never do that. We would lose face if we violated our tradition. And I think everybody from the Americans in the room thought, OK, that's not going to work here. Uh, <laughs> probably not the only way to enforce this, if, that, if that's uh, what we had to rely on. Um, so maybe Japan, is, in that sense, it hasn't caught up in the, with the UK uh, need for formalizing. And that's maybe a, a, to their credit. So that's a theme, just in terms of how do you study this, which is it turns out to be deeply embedded in practice and norms and customs. A second theme is about um, a problem that at least many countries told us, that they, and including in Japan, um, which is that the nature of international law has changed radically in recent years. It is not just treaties that you write down and negotiate in the kind of typical way, and maybe a few international organizations. We have just a massive amount of international administrative law, kind of like the rise of the administrative state in the United States during and after the New Deal. And a lot of the traditional foreign relations law is not equipped to deal with international administrative law. What do you do with all of the non-binding memoranda of understanding that administrative agencies around the world are making all the time that are hugely consequential but are not exactly treaties, not addressed in their formal law? And a lot of countries are seeing this. Or, or the need, just the high need for a lot of agreements that are binding of it and don't necessarily go through the full legislative process. And most countries think they do need more of those, partly just because the numbers are so high. You can't have the legislature approve every single agreement, which is also true, I think, in the US. In the US, our Constitution says every treaty has to go to the Senate. Two thirds of the Senate have to advise and consent. We make less than 10% of our international agreements in that process today, and that's been true for decades, because it's just not feasible to have all of those agreements. The Trump administration, you might think, well, probably never makes agreements, right? Not true. They've made hundreds of international agreements in the last two and a half years. And almost none have gone to the Senate. That probably wouldn't surprise you, but they don't. That's true of Obama as well. And it was true of Bush, that the vast majority of the agreements they made are not going to the Senate because it would even not be feasible to do that. How do you then address it? Because it's quite consequential. It means that the president is now even more powerful in making international policy. And I don't think any country has a good solution, by the way. But we learned, for example, that Spain just passed a new treaty law trying to get at this and having all sorts of new transparency and reporting rules for all of these administrative type arrangements which were just slipping under the radar in Spain. And by the way, they're slipping under the radar in the US as well. Uh, and so there may be some interesting comparative insights there. So how do you get the legislature, if you think it's a good idea, to be re-engaged? Big theme. And then finally, and it's one thing that uh, Professor Helford actually touched on in his chapter for the book, and a number of other people did, and I had not fully thought about this until the book uh, was worked on, which is there's international law, you know, treaties and customs and things that bind nations, and then there's this kind of domestic foreign relations machinery. It turns out the two bodies have very big effects on each other. And I knew a little bit of that, that is to say, I'm sure the way we make treaties and conclude them affects our practice in international affairs and our compliance with international norms. So I can see that. It turns out it works the other way, too, in ways I would never would have seen until we had the book. So I'll just give you one example, because Professor Helfer touched on it in his chapter, which is um, a lot of people on the Brexit decisions, an example of this, are worried, and a lot of people are worried about this for President Trump. He, as you probably have seen in the news, he's withdrawn the United States from numerous international agreements. But people were thinking about this worry, executives just pulling countries out too easily of their obligations. And they were wondering what to do about it. Some thinking maybe the courts, like in the UK, could provide some pushback. But it's not going to be, not going to always be the case, depending on the court system. And the US, it's another area where our courts have not shown an inclination to get involved, just like the war issues. So if it's not that, are there other ways to kind of think about that? Maybe the legislature can, again, reassert itself to try to have a role at the back end of treaties. Well, it turns out international law is not well suited to help the legislatures. It is not designed to help them. It's not designed to help the courts. It's actually designed to help the executive. And I don't think people actually thought about that. I don't think when they were writing the rules of international law, they said, let's think about how to empower presidents and executive organs per se. They were just basing it on what they saw in the system, and they didn't think about the normative aspects of it. But it turns out international law says if an executive sends a notice of withdrawal, say to the UN, it's presumptively valid. It turns on any timing clock to turn off the treaty. 
And there's no basis for looking behind it, even if they're violating their own constitution, even if they're violating a court order in their country, international law has nothing to kind of back up the court or the legislature to fight back against the executive. And Professor Helper touched on that in history. Another South African author touched on it in hers, actually calling for international law to now change itself to deal with the foreign relations issue that people are so worried about in terms of treaty exit that's become kind of a more prominent issue, I would say, in the last decade or so. But it was a, it's something I think we would have never seen but for that uh, the books, uh, chapters talking to each other on those uh, topics. Okay, so those are a few themes. Um, anxieties, which I think may be the most interesting thing that I ran into in working on, on the book. Um, things that scare people as I'm working on it. So foreign relations law is not very new in the US. Um, I, I said maybe the 50s. One could actually even go back to the 20s when there were some treatises on what I would call foreign relations law in the US. Um, Quincy Wright and others writing in the field. But by the 50s, the US is starting to generate, uh, you all know restatements of the law, like on torts and agency and contract. Well, they're starting to generate the first restatement on the foreign relations law of the US. Probably not coincidentally, right as the US is emerging as a major post-World War II power. And it, it's now bringing together its own thoughts about foreign relations law, putting them into the restatements. A lot of academics, Lewis Hankin probably most prominently becomes the real leader of the field of US foreign relations law in the 60s and 70s in particular. And then there's another restatement that's eventually published in the 1980s. Um, we actually have a new restatement part in part that I worked on, just came out last year. So the US has had this conversation going uh, that I've described for quite some time, many decades. Not true in a lot of other countries. Germany a little bit, and a little bit in the UK, and you've seen the Commonwealth Foreign Relations Treatise, but that's very recent. Most countries don't have even the label foreign relations law, and you might wonder why not. They have the same issues about executive versus Congress, what role their courts can play, and the like. And part of the reason is actually, I think, a more of a siloing of academia in other countries. That's not the whole reason. But it turns out, in the US, I think this is an advantage of the US, by the way, it's easy to kind of mix things in academia in the US. You can be an international lawyer and a constitutional lawyer in the same person. And I've had the pleasure of sort of being that, being able to operate in a two-track. Much harder in a lot of countries that are much more sharply defined. You're either over in the international side or you're a domestic person. And they often don't do a lot of talking to each other, at least until recent years. It would be hard to have a foreign relations law academic field if they're just completely separate. And I think academia in the US has been more flexible for quite some time. So that's part of the reason. But when I talk to this, uh, and I talk to other people in other countries about maybe developing their fields of foreign relations law more academically, the concern I hear, heard from a number of people was um, sort of twofold. One is they were worried it might undermine the primacy of international law. And I think the reasoning would be this foreign relations law really focuses on the domestic. It focuses on maybe even on barriers to the international arena, how you have to have some kind of uh, you know, incorporation of international law into a different system of your foreign relations law system. Sometimes foreign relations law is literally a set of doctrines that, about things that make it hard to do international law or that prevent it from being effectual. And I think there was just a fear that if we start focusing on this, it'll just mean we'll come up with new reasons not to develop international law or to impede its progress. Um, I'm not a fan of not talking about things because we're afraid of them, so that would have been one of my responsive uh, responses. Um, but I also noted uh, in our discussions that foreign relations law is a header. It doesn't actually tell you your choices about how embraceive you should be about international law, where you should distribute authority to deal with international law and the like. And countries that are much more embraceive of international law and incorporate it more directly than the US have foreign relations law. And it's their foreign relations law. And they can be quite proud of it if they like the choices that it makes. And merely talking about that heading should not um, cause it to go in one direction or another. It's really just a, a label. Um, and I think by not having the label, my argument at least had been that they lose things uh, that involve useful conversations between different um, areas of expertise, as I've already mentioned. Um, and also, it's hard to understand other systems. Like, why is it that another system is not complying uh, 
fully or not incorporating. And if you don't study their foreign relations law, you would have a very tough time. You might just say they don't like international law, but it's often an oversimplification. And I think better understandings of their federalism or their constitutional arrangements would likely lead to better, at least, uh, understanding of what's going on in the di different systems. Um, I also, I sort of, I used, I think, the, something from the Moliere uh, quote about, um, you know, you've actually been doing foreign relations law, you know, all your life, you just didn't know it. Um, you know, you've been speaking prose and not realizing it. And that's what your foreign ministry lawyers are doing every day. That is the core of the State Department foreign ministry lawyer's job, is really this. And when I was worked a bit in the government in the State Department, it was, it was these issues that we dealt with all the time. But they were the same issues in the UK and in Germany and Japan. And um, so I saw some usefulness of kind of tying them together. And it's not just for the United States. And that's, I think the related anxiety was this, though, um, which is maybe they'd be too influenced by the US. Uh, the US, I heard, already has a, you know 50 or more years of foreign relations law scholarship. It has people who've led the field. Does that mean they're now going to adopt the US approach? And a lot of them don't think they'd like it if they did. Um, one decision I'll just cite that they really hate, by the way, most, many of them hate, is US Supreme Court decision from 2008 called Medellin versus Texas. It's about whether the US would comply with the decision of the International Court of Justice that would give new hearings to people on death row, basically, in various US states because of a treaty breach, which clearly did happen. And the US Supreme Court was not helpful to that, said the treaty obligations there did not operate to override Texas, in that case, Texas's law on the death penalty and, and the procedures. And they refused to stay the execution. In fact, that person in that case was executed on death row. And that kind of opposition or re refusal to kind of go along with the International Court of Justice's decision was viewed as you know, emblematic of the kind of US isolationism sometimes on these issues. But clearly part of American foreign relations law, which was cited throughout the Supreme Court, Justice Robert, Chief Justice Roberts' opinion. And they noticed the US sometimes withdraws from treaties, very much at the moment with the Trump administration. The US is very active at the use of force abroad, sometimes quite controversially, like predator drone strikes and the like. And so the fear was they have this developed foreign relations law. And if we start doing that, would we then start to look like that? Would, and would we become things that we're worried about? My main response is actually what I'm seeing when nations are kind of focusing on foreign relations, they actually just stake out contrarian positions against the US uh, in, in literally to, as a contrast. Um, Ghana Supreme Court a couple years ago says, oh, they had a, a case about whether they could make an executive agreement without going to their legislature. It was actually about rehousing Guantanamo detainees. And it looked like on the US side, the president was able to just make it on his own. He didn't go to Congress. And the Ghana Supreme Court said, yeah, but that's not our system. And our constitution says we've got to go to the legislature. And we realize we've got, they've kind of ignored it in the US, but we're not the US, and you've got to go to the legislature. And they required that that happen. Um, the UK Supreme Court, in a series of cases, has just distinguished itself from US foreign relations law in the last few years on a bunch of foreign affairs. Dr. Germany's constitutional court just expressly distinguishes itself several times on war powers by saying, we know US courts won't look at these issues. They think they're kind of disempowered. Um, but we think they're wrong. We think there shouldn't be a political question kind of bar. We think we actually can judicially manage this. And they've issued a number of war powers decisions that you would not see from the US Supreme Court. So I, I just haven't seen it. Uh, if anything, I think um, focusing on the choices that are matter to countries actually allows them to stake out their own position. At least that's the argument I gave. Um, and I, maybe it's working, because a number of countries now are starting to develop courses in the area. And um, some books are actually in progress outside of the US in, this, in these topics. And so it looks like people are trying their own kind of take on their own foreign relations law. There's one other anxiety I wanted to mention, though, because these are all kind of liberal progressive anxieties, pro-international laws. I haven't yet encountered it just because of the audience, but I will, which is a conservative anxiety which is how dare you start looking abroad to figure out American constitutional foreign affairs law. This is the American Constitution. We do not, this was done in Philadelphia. The founders adopted it. It's out of the American experience. We shouldn't be influenced by the European attitudes about you know, how we go about foreign affairs, military force, and the like. And that kind of objection has been very prominent 
in other areas of comparative constitutional law, like on the death penalty, when the US Supreme Court has occasionally cited to foreign practice, a comparative practice, conservative commentators said the Eighth Amendment should not be controlled by the attitudes of the rest of the world. It's really an American decision. And I think some of that would probably come up here. My main response here is there's so much to be done without even getting into constitutional law, if you, do, if you think that's a problem. Um, just understanding other countries, as I've said, is useful for um, interacting with them. I also think a lot of this is about statutory and regulatory drafting. And I don't know the argument about why you should not. Turns out has a really well-crafted recent war power statute. If we think ours in the US is not good and almost nobody likes it, I don't see the argument for at least not reading the German statute. Turns out, like they're really better about definitions. We, we, threw, in, we threw in the word in the War Powers Resolution, you know, the president's supposed to get congressional permission when they're in hostilities. Not really defining it. Well, a certain presidential lawyer decided that if we're bombing a place like crazy, but they're not bombing us back, no hostilities. Uh, it's not hostilities coming in our direction, and so the president doesn't, I won't mention that presidential lawyer by name, other than they teach at Yale, but nothing else about that person <laughs> will be mentioned. And the Germans went out of their way not to use such a kind of an open-ended word and have much more precisely defined ideas about ever involving in any kind of armed interactions, try to really tighten that up, and I thought uh, we could learn something from that. Um, and then even in the constitutional law area, I would just say that not everybody thinks it's all fun formalistic. If you think there's some functional discretionary elements of our constitutional reasoning, that should invite thinking about how things have worked well or not well in other places if they've dealt with somewhat similar questions. Just to take one example, I think our Supreme Court, at least our lower courts have said, it's just not judicially manageable to ever impose standards on the president about when they would have to go to Congress on military issues. The German Supreme Court, the Constitutional Court said, no, actually we think there are ways. We can't, we can't decide the policy question. We can't decide whether a rescue mission made good sense. Obviously, there are things that courts are not equipped for, the German court said. But with a carefully defined statute, with certain parameters about what we're deciding and not deciding, the German courts repeatedly said, yeah, we think we, can, we will not overly hamper our executive by having some interventions on war powers Maybe they're right and maybe they're wrong. Maybe it doesn't work in the United States and maybe it would. But it's an interesting idea to think about whether there are judicially manageable standards. And I don't know the argument for why we wouldn't at least want to look at why they think there would be in another uh, country. So those are some of my arguments I would make. I haven't really been challenged by the conservative side of that, but, but I'm ready for it if it, if it happens. <laughs> um, final points, uh, just to kind of round it out, because uh, now that I have the book out and um, it's been a really interesting learning experience. I, I expect to continue to learn. Um, so this is my sort of the future is now. Uh, now that the book's out, what happens now that a conversation has really started? Uh, US foreign relations law very developed, not as much in most other countries, although there are now courses in Canada, Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany. A number of countries all of a sudden are offering law school courses on their own foreign relations law, which I think is a very good start, and in a couple of those places, seminars or courses in comparative foreign relations law. And so I'm seeing some of that start to take off. Um, what, would, what would I like to see? Um, oh, one other thing. I just went to Germany uh, not too long ago for a conference. They're doing a new book project just on the question that emerged from the handbook, um, one of the themes. What about that interface between the international law that people have studied for so long and this kind of newer thing we're talking about, foreign relations law, what other insights might authors get about the interactions between those? And they're actually having a whole book project. And a bunch of authors who are not in the handbook from a lot of countries that were not represented in the handbook are actually now talking about that for this new book, which um, I think is exciting. Camel McLaughlin and I are then writing kind of concluding uh, chapters for that book. And I think that's a great direction to add to what we've already done. Um, I do want to develop teaching materials now that a bunch of courses are developed in other countries. Um, th th this, is actually, this book's actually being used for teaching right now, um, even in a course at Harvard at the moment. And I think, I, I'd like to think that's helpful, but I also would like, like excerpts of cases and statutes and things which I need help from a lot of other people in other countries to know how to pull those together, and I, I probably will do that. I've had this kind of fantasy, I've told deans before at Duke the last few years, I imagine a Duke class of students here for a semester 
And at the same time, in you know, a few other universities in other countries, we're all doing the same course together on foreign relations law with their groups of students, with online and video interactions around the same sets of topics, whether it be treaties and war powers, and talking, at least online and email and the like, between the different students, comparing, you know, maybe the easiest to start with, say, UK, Germany, Canada, something like that arrangements with the US and the Duke students talking to their counterparts in other classes. Um, I think that would be fascinating. It would help also develop teaching materials, I think, if, we, if I did that. So that's on my agenda for some time. If the video technology will cooperate, that's part of the issue for me. Um, scholarly research. Uh, the biggest thing we need is just more information. So if you look through the handbook, I think the good news is that every area of the world, a region of the world, has some representation, but some much more than others. A little bit of Latin America, sort of a one general comparative one, I think, in a ch chapter on Mexico, but not a lot of some of the other specific interesting, uh, there's a lot of interesting foreign relations law in Latin America going on with their relationship to the international courts, like the Inter-American Court, that's touched on, but a lot more could be done there. Um, Africa, we have a big cross-cutting Commonwealth African chapter. We have South Africa very well represented. There's a lot of Africa that's not heavily represented. There. And that, some of that's true of Asia. We have, we have South Korea, we have China, we have Japan, but there are a lot of other countries that I'd be very interested in knowing about. And, in, and we know that the, that the big kind of, Tom Ginsburg in Chicago has this big database, it's fantastic, of all the constitutions of the world over time that researchers can search and do all sorts of quantitative analysis on. But it doesn't actually help on a lot of these questions, unfortunately. So Ona Hathaway at Yale and I have been talking about how to design some mechanism, almost kind of like a Wikipedia system that would, over time, uh, use the expertise of people around the world to fill in a set set of questions about the, the practice of foreign relations law beyond the formal written materials uh, that we wouldn't, so it was stuff we couldn't see very easily, and with an ideal set of something close to all the countries in the world. I don't know about North Korea. There may be a few that are really going to be difficult, but there are 193 countries in the world. It'd be great to have most of that filled out, because if you could have that and you were, it was reliable and you had lots of quality checking over time, combining that with the uh, you know, big and empirical methods would be fantastic. And we would, there would be tons of stuff we don't know that we, I think we would learn, both what's going on now and what's happened over periods of time. And so that's a future area of growth. Um, and then in terms of my own kind of conferences and thing, the one thing I wish I could do more with, I mean, one obvious thing is judges. So. Uh, so a friend of mine from the UK told me the other, other day they have a big uh, case in the UK Supreme Court. It'll be decided in the next few months, I think, on something called the Act of State Doctrine. If you've been one of my students, you've heard of that uh, common law doctrine in the US that limits how much our courts will examine what other governments have done abroad. The UK, have their own, UK has their own version of that doctrine. And a year or two ago, they actually made clear it's not the US version of the doctrine. They had their own views about it. And they have a kind of a human rights limit or exception to it that is not in the US version of it. And they have a new one that tests out the boundaries of that exception in the UK at the moment. A friend of mine, at least make, trying to make me feel good, at least said he knows one of the judges on the UK Supreme Court. And apparently said, on their desk is that book. So I'm just hoping um, there might be some opportunities for judicial engagement with it. And you know, obviously, you can imagine judges facing difficult questions about how to bring international law into their courts if they are going to. And, how to figure out when to make, they might be interested in hearing from uh, what other countries are doing. But even more to my mind would be more dialogue across the government lawyer standpoint and not just the judges. Foreign ministry lawyers who have to interact on diplomacy issues all the time, um, they just also bring a base of knowledge about the practice that even the judges don't have because they're the ones who literally have to carry all this out um, and know you know, the, the challenges of being a government lawyer in dealing with uh, foreign relations law and how they interact with the politician side of their governments. There used to be, I think, a fascinating amount of material that would only come out through there. And we got a little bit of that in Japan with the foreign ministry lawyers, but I could imagine a lot more. So I could imagine, I really want a conference. Uh, maybe a new bag of money is going to be required, but I would love a conference of foreign ministry lawyers brought together talking about some of these same topics and comparing uh, how they've dealt with these kind of different practices um, in response to the challenges we face. So those are a few of my ideas. Um, and I'm happy to take a few questions. We have a few minutes maybe on that. 
uh, that hopefully gives you a sense of how the book came to be and some of the themes that I thought emerged and maybe some of the stuff that will happen in the coming years. So thank you. Yes, Stuart. So I know nothing about any of this <laughs> in relation with international law, foreign relations law, but you were just making me think about this in terms of kind of the active state action with sort of a rule of recognition question. So does it ever come up? Like right now in, in, in Bolivia, you know, do, is there a question as to, as to who actually has the authority to sign the, the international agreement? And I'm, I'm assuming that the domestic answer in this country, in light of Zivotofsky, is it's up to the president to decide who, 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 gets, who he gets to, to sign with. Yes. So the president can find somebody in Bolivia that he decides is the, is, is the president, or maybe better yet, Venezuela, and he gets to say, guess what, I've just signed an executive agreement, and under Zivotofsky, you have to defer to it. Yes. Is that how it plays out? Uh, well, in the U.S., you're, you, you do know law because I, uh, in this area, because in the U.S., that is how it would play out. Yeah. That was all I know. Yeah. Uh, well, you got it right. Uh, that is to say, it's not just Zivotofsky. Even before, like when Aristide was thrown out of Haiti and the like, U.S. courts said, we will accept that the government in power is the one that the executive tells us is in charge, even if they're not physically in charge at the moment. So the executive, even before this uh, famous Zivotofsky case, has been deemed by the courts to kind of control that decision when there are competing sovereigns or governments, Panama, same thing. We're not going to say Noriega is in charge. Courts went along with the executive. Now, fascinating question, which international law is not very well developed to deal with, which is when you have competing claims and the uh, international repository or something then has to make a decision about whether to count it or not. Um, I don't know if you have a thought about that, Larry, because that comes up in treaty exit, which is your topic. If they got something from a disputed um, executive on an international criminal court exit or something, what do we do? Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they try to avoid the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Um, but they generally try to presume that the, you know, whoever is in de facto control is the one who can do that. And when you have long standing situations like I mean, Venezuela is a better example than Bolivia, right? Where you have recognized governments by a good number of other states and then you have the government that's in power. You know, I mean, and there, there are ongoing disputes about whether, for example, um, you know, the, um, I'm drawing a blank on which tours. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 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 Comment on differences other than geographical scope between your book and the first book, right? Uh -huh. yeah. McLaughlin's book that you yes. showed us a slide of. So, yeah. is are the would you say the methodologies are different? Is yeah. the overall zeitgeist reflected in the book different? Yes, and I will say uh, by the way, uh, I was very pleased that one of the intro chapters is by Callum McLaughlin because. Um, he obviously deserved credit for really focused, trying to bring the Commonwealth thinking on this and call it foreign relations law and uh, compare it with the United States. Um, the short answer, you know, which I won't do justice to, is zeitgeist is quite different, it seemed to me. And that was good. In fact, if you read the first seven chapters, it's all fighting about how to even think about foreign relations law. And he views it um, in what I would call choice of law terms. If anybody's taking conflict of law, choice of law, he thinks somehow foreign relations law is primarily kind of like a choice of law doctrine, and I don't so much. I think um, that doesn't actually, just giving, using that metaphor doesn't fully give me the answers to the questions. But for some reason, he is quite confident that if it's thought that way, it produces interesting answers, and ones that are more um, embraceive of international law, that he thinks his take is a take on foreign relations law that tends to give more primacy to international law, whereas mine is kind of agnostic. Mine would conclude as foreign relations law the very isolationist type countries all the way to the most unitary. And his is kind of tilted towards a framing that would pull more international law in. Um, Karen Knopf from a Canadian also has her own chapter about kind of framing it and choices that she thinks will be have to be made in the coming years. And she's kind of encouraging, don't necessarily accept my framing, which, is, which I thought was great, actually. I mean, you actually want that in a book when people are kind of disagreeing about the foundations, because that means it's really interesting how it evolves. And I think, and I and I've told people, if you don't, if you're something about the U.S. model, which is kind of agnostic about these that you don't like, there may be other ways of doing it. Um, I'm not fully persuaded by it, but it, but it is a very different zeitgeist. Now he's is one 
author by one in one book just about the Commonwealth. So another difference is, um, you know, it obviously is not giving you a flavor for a lot of different competing perspectives. He's really, it's just the history of the Commonwealth approach, very British kind of approach on this, very common law oriented as a result. So I have a lot of civil law systems and others represented in the book, and I think that also gives you not just geographic, but kind of a different approach as well. Yeah. Other, any other questions about that? Yeah, Jerry. Uh, thank you for the wonderful contributions. I'm wondering if any of your commentators dwelt on the, uh, the, the potential uh, consequences of uh, the U.S. withdrawing from the climate change agreement. There, there, there are these sort of obscure things like Bush's ability <laughs> That raises two sets of issues, that are, both of which are a bit outside of my expertise, but I'll mention what they are. One is, is there any problem with the withdrawal itself? As, as, but it's a really interesting case study, which is, how did uh, President Obama join the Paris Convention on Climate Change? Anybody know? Did the Senate vote two-thirds? Uh, did anybody in Congress vote anything? No. They, Obama realized he couldn't even get the majority of Congress, unfortunately, to my mind, because I think climate change is one of the major pressing problems of our time. And he couldn't even get a majority of Congress to go along with trying to deal with climate change. So he finds a, his lawyers to come up with an idea for joining a major multilateral convention. And then in the past would have gone to the Senate, by the way. Um, and prior environmental treaties had gone to the Senate. And he managed to say that some of it's an implementation of a prior treaty, Framework Convention on Climate Change from the 90s, which the Senate had already approved. But, what, but nobody thought you could get a mandatory reduction in emissions based on the prior treaties because they had to punt it on that. So what he, he, his negotiators actually got the rest of the negotiators to agree to make that middle part of the treaty not mandatory, but aspirational. And by saying it was aspirational, he said it's not a binding piece of a treaty, and therefore I don't have to take that piece back to the Congress. And I can do that on my own. So it was very interesting foreign relations law. And Jack Goldsmith and I wrote a whole article about interesting new ways presidents are making international law in, that, in the Paris But it does, unfortunately, invite an easy exit, in my opinion, as well. Now, the Obama people and others were very thoughtful. That's one of the hardest exit treaties otherwise, because they said you couldn't even start the clock for like years to exit. And then another year goes by. And it was strangely designed so that if the US pulled out, it would not actually be able to effectually pull out until the day after the next presidential election. Who knows? I mean, that's a weird date. I don't know how that was pure coincidence, I'm sure. Um, so Trump has initiated withdrawal. He said he was going to, and now he has. But it won't actually be effective until like the day after the November elections, interestingly enough. I think that you know, might have been by design. But I think it was easy for him to claim constitutional authority to do that, because like Obama didn't even go, any, go to the Congress in the first place. I think that's very easy. Your other issue is about just general international law. Is there international law and environmental responsibilities that go on beyond whether you're willing to agree to a treaty? And Larry and I in the journal do publish some articles trying to push for more mandatory norms of that might be analogous to some tort norms that go beyond treaty. But it's, you're, it's pushing against the mainstream, which is you know, you've got to convince consensual nations to go along. And it's too bad. A lot of people are saying international law is very weak for this, because if you have a pressing global crisis and you need consent, it's a choice between the planet falls apart or you, res you, know, you, you respect the sovereignty norms of international law. People think maybe international law is not as too traditional. And there's been some push. We've published some articles saying, Let's, let's have more mandatory norms. So that's a good question. Uh, Guy. So this is fascinating for a number of reasons, um, including the, the intersection of what foreign, at least as I understand foreign relations law to be from you and others, um, the comparative aspect of it, the international, the domestic. Yep. And the question, and it seems that this is an intellectual area that um, at least as you've described it, depends also upon having partners around mm -hmm. the world yes. where you have information asymmetries and different types of institutional capacities. Um, and of course, you've described your work with ONA and trying to get that happen. And I guess if you could expand more on to what extent does uh, the U.S., both academic and your leadership of, the, of, of this, what extent is it helpful or hurtful in developing this field of comparative foreign um, relations 
relation to law? What are sort of the... If you're asking me whether I'm helpful, I'm going to say yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The U.S. as a whole, would you talk yeah. about how people, some of the yeah. actions people have are yeah. against, a, I guess, some sense of U.S. hegemony yeah. and, and... There is a worry about that. I do... I think the early signs are going to be reassuring to people, like I said, because some of the early signs are, in fact, interventions in other countries, including not just you know big Western powers, but others like Ghana and others that are just saying, no, we really think we can do our own thing. So I think this will help my case a little bit. I do think we're, to the extent we can have, you know, if we have resources for conferences and other things, which is not always going to be true in the developing countries, we obviously can be facilitative and helpful and putting together databases that would also be lots of student research assistants and others. So we can be helpful, um, it, particularly if we're lo really looking to try to increase the kind of diversity of viewpoints and things like that, which I think we are. I always, and this is a final thing about me and kind of everything I've done since I've been teaching, ideological diversity to me is hugely important. I think this is, by the way, this is a big topic in law schools right now, as you know, student bodies, faculties, conferences. Um, ever since I've been, I write with liberals and conservatives a lot, and you know, I have a lot of co-authors. And in the book, you will find a mix of views around the world and having them needing to talk to each other, um, I think, is an advance, actually. Because what I worry about is people just talking to the people who already agree with them. It happens way too much. All the social media is all about just talking to people who are already agreeing with you. And I think facilitating conversations, including, by the way, conservatives you know, in the US who have make it, you know, if they go into this, they actually have now have to embrace with things that I think they would not have wanted to do. So I think that's true in a lot of countries. And so that would be one uh, thing I think we could contribute. But. Maybe out of time. But thank you so much for coming. I enjoyed it.